We're back. Welcome to episode 207 of No Direction. Sorry, of the No Direction podcast, the No Direction Network's Pathfinder News Reviews and Interviews podcast. I'm Ryan Costello. And I'm Jefferson J. Thacker, also known as Pam. Good news, career nerd in chat. You did not miss the review. You finally got to catch one from the start, thanks to technical difficulties that delayed us by about 15 minutes. We're here for the best Jerry review. This is Tui's best Jerry one. It's been out since August. It came out alongside the core rulebook, which is much better than first edition when we had to wait until November for oh, the best Jerry to come out. And we had to do that again for Starfinder, and it was agonizing. Yes. Oh, man, I keep forgetting that Starfinder did a lot of the things that you questioned why first edition did them. But Starfinder didn't need to do them. But you know, but another... This isn't a Starfinder podcast, Param. Yeah. But you know another game that did that? Dungeons and Dragons? Yeah. Dungeons and Dragons famously has done that. And did fifth edition, did it release all at once? It did. But third edition... Fourth edition did, I know. And third edition did. And 3.5 did. And I guess everybody just thinks that people love reading a rule book and not playing the game for a month. But <laughs> that's not how I like to play. But sorry, no, when I say 4th edition did, I meant it did what 5th edition did of releasing the core books at the same time. Right. Which was, yeah, they, like, it was noted as, hey, how about we just release them all? This is the game, so let's give them all to you. Which is what uh, Pathfinder did for 2nd edition, although we're still missing some pretty integral rules, and it ends up that the Game Mastery Guide, which is not out until January and was originally re uh, scheduled for, I believe, a November release, is now much more important than the first edition game mastery guide was. And so we have a, like we we've got like 80% of second edition out. Right. But there's some important things about NPC and monster building that we won't have until that book comes out. Exactly. But so that is, go ahead. But we, at least we got monsters. We do. And the question then comes, Param, since this is so core to the game, What's even the point of review in the book? Like, if people like second edition, like the question was, would you like second edition based on the core rule book? Once you know you like the core rule book, the best year is a given, right? Like, are we just talking to people that either know or know they, they know they're either getting it or not getting it for sure? I mean, it's nice to at least know if the best year lives up to its past legacy of a game that has released amazing best years. I mean, we have. We have always been impressed with what Paizo brings out with the Bestiaries, especially from Bestiary 3 onwards, when they started getting themes and really flavorful monsters and pulling in. And, and all the Alien Archives have been great. Um, Pathfinder has a long history of high standards to live up to. And if they don't live up to that standards with the initial offering... <laughs> yeah, and especially, like because it could do the legacy of 3.5 and 3.5 was reverse com or pathfinder was reverse compatible with 3.5 and one of the easiest things to port over was monsters mm -hmm. and 3.5 had five monster manuals i believe plus the fiend folio and so like people weren't hurting for monsters plus there was a lot of third-party content that was famous for its monsters so the fact that they continued to release these great bestiaries really showed just how good paizo is at making a bestiary Right, and and honestly, and I love three five, but beyond Monster Manual two and halfway about halfway through the third one, they kind of dropped off. You started getting third one rhinoceroses was... with lightning. <laughs> <laughs> well, and then they kind of got into like half bestiary, half encounters. Anyway, we know Paizo's good at monster books. Here's the second edition monster book. One more thing before we get into it. Oh, before. Second edition came out before the playtest came out. Before second edition was announced, mm -hmm. we kind of had a series of debates about philosophy of design and direction, where you came to the conclusion that you preferred top-down design, which is just need-based design and a little more minimalist. Whereas I like bottom-up design, which is holistic and systematic, and it's just you, you, you know, you build to a system rather than building to needs. I think that first, is accurate. Yes, first edition. Uh, was uh, the design philosophy was more in line with my preferences. Yes. Second edition is more in line with your preferences. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I do want to clarify that just because I am not, just because second edition did not go my preferred direction, mm -hmm. one, it means that the book could be successful and I could potentially not like it. But it also means that the book could be successful at its goal of designing top down and I can like it. Mm -hmm. Not having my preferences met does not 
preclude me to disliking this bestiary. Right. And also, just because they went with a monster format I like, if this is full of a bunch of crappy monsters <laughs> and, and skeletons that do silly things like fall into xylophones or something, I might not like it. I mean... <laughs> we actually we've already read this i mean it, we're acting like we're just gonna review it now uh like like we haven't seen it but no we've we've totally been playing with this for a while now one more part of this preamble oh is that the other thing that we were debating was campaign integration into mm -hmm. the core rulebook line i preferred uh campaign agnostic rules you preferred campaign integration and second edition once again went more to your tastes after mm. first edition, well, at least at the start, and for most of its uh, right. most of its run, was more to my preferences. So, my uh, review of the core rulebook, which I believed was positive, although I've been told that uh, I came off a lot more negative about second edition than I believe I intended to be, um, as like that doesn't necessarily reflect the best Jerry, which is really focusing on the things that I said I have different philosophical views on. So right. you want to get into the best area? Yeah, let's actually let's actually look at this thing because you know <laughs> it's it's a it's a book, and it is it is a book. There's over 400 monsters in here, many of which are classics, some of which are Galarian classics. They're monsters that, if you know the campaign setting, you are you you are more uh, inclined to like these than say Dungeons Dragons player. Like the Wendigo is in here, and that's mm -hmm. something that's become more of a Pathfinder monster, even though it's just one of those classic monsters they took. And then there's some exclusive monsters like Tree Razor, who is absolutely tied into Galarian and the 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 world lore, the campaign setting lore. Right. No Froghemoth. I know. Uh, not even like a renamed Froghemoth. No. Oh, but there is a giant. There is a giant frog though. I know, and I looked closely because it's like, is this supposed to be the Froggy Myth now? No, I'm pretty sure that is a different kind of giant frog monster. It's not my precious Froggy Myth. Um, so, I mentioned that uh, some monsters have been renamed. Yeah, that's a thing. Do you want to, like, so there's a history to this. Right. It's well, that, go ahead. No, no, you go ahead. You you had a plan. Okay, so the... Um, the 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 SRD the the rules, uh, sorry the the license that allows Pathfinder to exist because it's based on Dungeons and Dragons and lets other publishing companies produce rules based on three point X Dungeons and Dragons allowed the use of most monsters. There were some specific ones that were uh, definitely created for Dungeons and Dragons, like the Beholder, the Displacer Beast the Gith Yankee, things that had no real world or mythological origin, they were uh, they were not allowed to be re-released uh, in future publications by other publishers. However, the license's gray area was how accessories played into this. And so you could have the uh, editor cap in a future monster book published by other creatures but uh, other publishers but the question was whether you can then release a miniature called edder cap or if that's something only wizards of the coast had as one of their intellectual properties yeah. i say it's a gray area because paizo decided to avoid this instead yeah. of actually challenging the law or seeing if what they can get away with right. so the edder cap when it got a miniature it was called the web lurker and now the edder cap in bestiary uh, the second edition bestiary one is called the web lurker. So there's a lot of times where it had like a proper creature name mm -hmm. has been given a weird, like this is what the locals would call that giant spider thing. And then sometimes it was a creature that had a, this is what the locals would call that creature, but now it has a proper name. It's basically, they are trying to be a little more consistent with the tie-in products and their published books. So a lot of creatures got renamed for copyright reasons. It's not a fun reason to have to rename a monster and it will cause some confusion for a little while i believe we will get used to it probably where it's going to be most confusing is where say we've got the blood bug which is a miniature oh but yeah this uh, sturge was renamed but in the best area it's be renamed the blood seeker mm -hmm. so now we've got multiple different alternate names for the sturges so yeah. if you're wondering why there's all these renames and why familiar creatures are now being you know, slapped. Why, why is my familiar editor cap suddenly a web lurker? Mm -hmm. That's why. It's for accessories. It's for not reasons mm -hmm. that relate to you, but now we as gamers have to deal with it. 
And I, uh, I collected a few of these, just for example. The Ankeg is now called the Ankrov. That one's pretty close. Um, the Mites are now Mitflits. I was confused about that one when I encountered it the first time. I almost thought Me they were... Me too, because they've released Mites miniatures, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah, they have. Um, this is the one that super got me. The Treants are now called the Boreals. I kind of like it, though. It's, it's, it's weird. I thought Treant this one was actually pretty might generic. Not be, it might not relate to uh, Wizards of the Coast IP. That one might relate to Tolkien IP, because the Treants are the Ents, and they couldn't call them Ents for the same reason you couldn't call Halflings Hobbits, where it's like, these aren't strictly the creatures of myth. These are the more exclusive to Lord of the Rings creatures that Tolkien had created. And so you have to do a slight rename and they went from Ent to Treant. This is, I, I've never seen it officially declared that this is why the Treants were renamed. I wasn't expecting the Treants to be renamed. There are Boreals now. I think it's a cool name and uh, I, I'm not going to miss Treant, even though like, I know what a Treant is. I know the Boreals are supposed to be them. And I guess the biggest one for Pathfinder is the Aboliths are now the all Galuthu. I don't know uh, if I got that name right. No, that's not entirely true. Yeah, they still have Aboleth in small brackets. They're called Agaluthu Master now, what you would call an Aboleth. Um, it does have a little Aboleth in brackets next to its name. And then the Agaluthu, I know I'm getting this name wrong. <laughs> All Galuthu. I'm trying to load up the. <laughs> I'm trying to load up the page. I'm trying to find the page. It's now a catch-all that includes scums, faceless yes. stalkers, and, of course, the Aboleth themselves, which are now called all Galuthu Masters, and then there's the Veld Masters. <laughs> um, yes. Yeah. So the prehistoric sea-based creatures that once enslaved all of Galarian are now lumped together as, like, cousin races, and they are categorized together in the book in the same way that demons and devils and archetypes were kind of given the umbrella title. Mm -hmm. And then when you go into it, you see the multiple different creatures. So Abolith, right. there is still a creature called an Abolith. Uh, and it's just that now it's not the exclusive name of the Abolith. And when I was talking about campaign integration, this is the kind of thing that tripped me up a little bit because to me, the scum had nothing to do with the Abolith besides being aquatic. Yeah. And if I was trying to find a scum, even the fact that I know about the campaign setting, I would look under S. Well, luckily, if you look under S, it will tell you, like in the the uh, the the table of contents. If you look under S, it will tell you to go to page twelve. But mm -hmm. if you're just flipping through to section S, because we've got a handy um, handy sidebar that shows you what uh, mm -hmm. you know where to find your approximate letter ranges, yeah, mm -hmm. that one you would miss. I did something similar when I was running our uh, our, mm -hmm. our yak based adventure, where one of the monsters I had was a pixie, and they were minor minor monster in the encounter, and I kept forgetting that pixie was listed under I believe it was sprite, uh, which I kept going to F thinking that it would be under fairy. Right. So a lot of these categorical names are a little confusing to me. Um, I actually I I. I didn't like that devils and demons and stuff were always placed lumped together in uh, the uh, first edition bestiaries. So the fact that now they've expanded on the using of these umbrella terms and that the exact logic behind all of the umbrella terms is not entirely clear. Mm -hmm. It's going to take a lot of getting used to how this book is now organized. Right. And overall, I'm going to lump it under like minor quibble, not like major talking point because eventually we are going to get used to it and the table of contents does make it easy to find the thing if you uh, can't find it through a page flip and you know for the most part these do sort of make sense after you get used to them but you know if you just come in on board this is where you're going to have a little bit of a bump between the renames and the recategorizations it's going to you might do like i did and go wait was the mites only in that one PFS adventure and then spend several hours thinking that they're not in the book and then find them under Gremlin. Or you'll hope that the frog Hemoth is in there just renamed and you'll look and you'll look and you'll look and you find no frog no. Hemoth. <laughs> no. Uh, and, and that's a good thing. So what is in here? 
Um, a lot of the classics, a lot of what you would consider in your basic Monster Manual 1, your basic Bestiary 1, are in here. You're going to have your giant wolves, you're going to have your big bears, you're going to have your orcs and your gnolls and your kobolds and your demons and your devils and all the dragons. And, you know, we can kind of just do this by number, but then you also have a sprinkling, I would say a sprinkling, not a big dose, of Pathfinder-specific monsters. You got your bunyips. Bunyips have become a Pathfinder staple. Um, you've got you've got Tree Razor. You've you've got various weird fungus plant monsters. They have added a lot of those. <laughs> well, they cover a lot of the broad categories, and so plant creatures, for whatever reason, is given as much attention as a lot of the other categories. I I'm sure you're kind of upset though that slimes seem to have gotten the short end of the stick here. Yeah, it oozes. We only got like the two pages of ooze, and you got and they're all. They're under the ooze umbrella. Yeah, they've always been under the ooze umbrella, though. Slime has been a yeah. Slime, slime, referring to them as slimes primarily is mostly a Japanese um, thing because of the success of the Dragon Quest series. Oh, but I meant that uh, alphabetically where they are placed in the book, it's ooze, and then you've got all the different types of ooze. Whereas before, black pudding would be in B, and oh yeah. Actually, no, I'm glad all the oozes are together because it makes it easy to find your oozes. Um, at least I knew once I caught on, I knew exactly where to find my gelatinous cube. Now, earlier when you were saying how great the first edition best series were, you said especially three on. Yeah. And best year one was great too. Best year two was largely seen as the low point. And one of the reasons was it felt like it was filling in a lot of the necessities mm -hmm. for the cosmology. There's the no cosmology really gets represented in this yeah. second edition bestiary one and it, it weighed it down a little bit it just especially because so many of them start with a so when you're just flipping through the books of looking for exciting monsters it's like yeah angels azadas aeons okay can we get to some just monster some oh, fantasy creature if you think that's annoying wait till you get to d you're gonna stay in there for a long time but at least it's devils dragons and demons all of things that me as the GM will be using much more actively than I will be using angels and mm -hmm. aeons. Yeah. Um, yeah, but that's, yeah, that's the danger of reading through a, a bestiary alphabetically, which is what you do when you're reviewing it. But, <laughs> but that was also you're... one of the great things about aboliths being so important to Pathfinder is that they're one of the first monsters. It's AB. And so you get right into a monster that's super important, really like it's a tentacly weird fish demon, like, kind of like an undersea dragon. And now... No, it takes us a little while to really get going. That's really only, f it more matters more for us as reviewers because mm -hmm. we will be digesting this book cover to cover, whereas most people will be using this based on needs. Mm -hmm. And for those of you that have been used to the first edition books uh, using the old uh, stat block format, um, the change to the newer, smaller stat block format has resulted in two things. Now, it's almost universally smaller, but as Ryan had pointed out, there's exceptions mind telling them the exception sure well the wendigo is the one that i saw had the least amount of flavor to it it has one long sentence and then a full page of stat block yeah most of the time when a creature was high level and significant it got a two-page spread or it got lumped into an umbrella category that allowed it to give a lot of lore up front and then the specific monsters got one or two sentences or maybe even a paragraph of lore yeah. the wendigo is one of the few exceptions where it's like this is almost entirely mechanical yeah and it's a big old stat block too um and i love the wendigo it's i mean both as american mythological monster it's terrifying um both using it in play it's terrifying and man this second edition version of him is super terrifying um but you know from the most part, the new stat block format means nice smaller stat blocks. Um, even the Wendigo, he he has a tiny stat block until you get to his special abilities that need like two thirds <laughs> of a page just to describe the horrible way this thing kills you. Um, and so that usually results in, well, if you look at the Weemoth, and I understand that our own uh, Mr. Alex Agunas is responsible for writing this critter um, that's right next to the Wendigo. You see nice small stat blocks, and then they have room for either a lot of uh, flavor text to put in to describe the monster, how it fits into the world, often how it fits into very specifically Galarian. For instance, the Weemoth here starts talking about House Throne of Cheliax, 
uh, in Nermethos and Molthoon, just right inside its stat blocks. Big, huge capital letter campaign setting. Or you do the thing... Oh, before you change pages. Uh-huh. One thing I do want to point out. Wendigo is level 17. Right. Weebeth is level 15. So it's not like the Wendigo, as a high-level creature, needs a bigger stat block. It's just this is a specifically elaborate monster. High-level creatures can still have these minimized stat blocks right. that fit nicely onto a chunk right. of page and, and this, of the whole page. And this Weebeth thing is scary. It wraps a freaking tentacle around you and drains your blood out. And while crushing you to death, it 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 juices you. <laughs> um, and then like you're gonna have a, a or what you see happen a lot is like with um, let me think of one. Uh, nulls, no, nulls is a good one for this. Let me find nulls. Flip flash. So like what would have been a zero HD creature in first edition. Right, where instead, well, instead of just having, like, the one warrior, like, what is that first level warrior of that would have looked like, we now have a splattering of stat blocks, where we have the Null Hunter, which is a, a creature too, we have the Null Cultist, which is like a castery Null, like, right in the book to use, the creature three, or, and of course, usually you get, like, a boss version, so you could run a very varied adventure full of Nulls, just using the bestiary, without having to customize a lot of critters because the smaller stat block format meant that they could shove several of them in into play where usually they wouldn't have this, the space for that. And can you go to page 340? We're talking about the zombies. The zom- Oh, man, I love the zombies. Yeah, the zombies is another great example of that because they've got the zombie shambler. The zombie brute is the one that I specifically, I particularly like because... When you're making zombies, normally you would be like, all right, so maybe I would make this specific giant, and then you would go through this the templating process. Whereas this is basically like, you're doing this giant because you want the big zombie, right? Well, here's your big zombie. Fill in the flavor of what kind of specific zombie it is, and maybe add some uh, mechanical abilities, which we'll get to mm -hmm. some of the advice about how you can modify monsters by adding abilities that this book does have. It doesn't have monster creation rules, but it does have a little bit in the introduction that we'll get to. And I do like the zombie Hulk, which just literally has an ability. It just throws other zombies at people. That's what I would do. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> and I do like that. I do like that the new format allows for both more critters to be on the stat blocks. And I want to talk about some of that uh, more here in a moment. And I do like that a lot of the monster flavor is able to be presented. Now, I like having more flavor, um, and I don't the fact mind. That we just talked about zombies, and then you switch to flavor. I've just got a bad taste in my mouth. <laughs> oh no! Now I don't mind the deep ties to Galarian on some of these. It's not. It's it does with some of these. It's for sure very deep. Like we we talked about the Weemoth, and it starts talking about House Thrun. Um, some of them is just like like the Cyclops, where it just talks about. These could be Cyclopses in any campaign setting. Like they had an old empire and doesn't mention what it was called. And they're real sad about losing it. And they're real mournful about being able to see the future that they don't like very much. And that's a fun way to add some flavor to the monsters. And you have these cool sidebar call outs. That's things like the demon, uh, the daemon. Let me get this one right. It's like the daemon. And then, of course, my whole thing crashes. My whole... <laughs> Darn it, why'd you crash, computer? I'm going to have to relaunch you, get all this fixed up again. That's not a very cool, computer. That's not very cool at all. But it's like the demon paradox, where it like, talks about how demons uh, revere the concept of uh, ending all life, but they themselves are living beings. They aren't undead as much as they would love to say they are. That you know, this is an inherent paradox in their very being, and then the last line is demons are sorry, demons don't spend a lot of time thinking about this. <laughs> <laughs> um, Justin P. Sluter, by the way, is saying corpse throwing, aka the meatball special. <laughs> oh. So, um, you were talking about the lore. I know at one point that would have bothered me a lot more, I did get used to it. But the probably where I take exception to how lore is integrated is something like where the in the Abilith's presentation, it doesn't take the time to say an Abilith is this psychic fish thing. It goes straight to thousands of years ago. And it's like, hold on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Tell me what this monster is so that if I do have an out of Galarian situation where I might need an Abilith, what is it? Now, I, I happen to know the Abilith, but 
to someone that's brand new to Pathfinder that might want to do a homebrew campaign, the Abeluth is almost a mystery unless they know how to grok lore out of mechanics. That kind of reminds me, this is a slight tangent of the format of Pathfinder Adventures. Uh, my players have gotten to making fun of me during this. Or if I'm running like a PFS scenario and I'm kind of running the pre-written adventure as it's presented where I'm supposed to read the room descriptions and like, they're like, okay, he's given this long description of this obvious combat arena room. And they're like, wait for it. And there's the giant <laughs> monster we would have known this right away. Yeah, I I know that's a specific guideline of not mentioning any living creatures in the rooms. I just never understood it. I feel like the first thing you should present is the most obvious thing someone sees yeah. when they walk into a room. There's a giant blood monster in the middle of this room. And by the way, the room has nice tiling. That's how yeah, I would okay. present it. Let me tell you about this fresco that's hidden behind the sloth demon. <laughs> uh, i do like that it's all new art um and the art is overall gorgeous um for instance even cats we have some really great cats here and that's all i have to say oh the big cats okay yeah yeah, yeah not the cat folk they're back here uh actually they're up up here cat folk also beautiful art um overall very good presentation, very good art, which is important for a bestiary. I imagine that there is, well, we know that there's a pawn set in their immediate future. With yeah, all, featuring I was all about this to art. say, hold that up. You'll notice, actually, can you flip through a couple of pages? Basilisk is the best one to show this. I know uh, what you're going to say. I know what you're going to say. There. You? Okay. Okay, I don't. But there's the basilisk, and notice how it's conveniently pawn shaped. Okay, yes, so yeah, if you'll notice as you flip through the pages, the footprint and the shape dedicated to the art is pretty consistent, mm -hmm. and you knew that was forward-thinking thinking about pawns, which I'm perfectly okay with. I actually uh, really appreciate when you could see greater thinking that's going into these decisions. Mm -hmm. I mean, the worms kind of break that mold, but I guess they're on really big pawns. Um... Yeah, or maybe it was just... Well, they're like, all gargantuan. They're not allowed to have pawns, so their art's free to reign. Oh, that could be. I was thinking maybe it was just every now and then there's a mistake. It wasn't properly communicated to the artist. But you're right. Maybe it was just go nuts because we can't fit this onto a pawn anyway. <laughs> yeah. Who knows? We have no inside information on this thing. Uh, by the way, like we mentioned that network member Alex Agunas was involved in this book. A, a, I don't know all of the network members that were involved in this book, but I know it was many. Not me, but many. So, but yeah, so we, as a full disclosure note, we can say that uh, Luis was one of the editors on this book, which is interesting because he's not normally, that's not usually his job. Uh, and right. Alex contributed to it. I don't think I noticed any other network members on here. When did but, v, um, plus, like lots of people that are under some of our shows. Um, contributed to it so yeah like we've got lots of ties to this book we have to disclaim that yeah, yeah. and the, the normal full disclosure is that you and i have both done various other freelancing work for pies with the publisher of this book yeah. but we have not been paid to do this review You're right this review these opinions are our own right <sighs> um could you uh, load up any random old monster something you like or whatever there's a couple of other format things that i want to point out oh i do want to talk about a rename thing real quick and oh, it, sure. it pulls up a mon and I'll pull up a monster. Our dire animals are gone. There is dire wolf, which is important because that was a real thing. There really were dire wolves. They lived in Appalachia. We have skeletons of them here. Um, there's a museum not very far from my house that I like to go to, and they have a dire wolf. It's really cool to see. Um, but dire bear and famously derpy bear is gone. He's now cave bear. A uh, dire rat is gone. It's now just giant rat. Most of the time, if it was a dire animal, they just went with di giant animal instead of dire. And with the exception of bear, because it got cave bear. And I think that's because when they made Derpy Bear the mini, they made the cave bear mini, not a dire bear mini. Career nerd wants to know if there's a dire shark. Uh, no, I don't. There's sharks, but I don't believe... They, we got a dire shark. Uh, I'm asking you, career nerd. By the way, cool name. Um, is there a particular... Oh, the Megalodon is the name of what could be seen as the dire shark. Yeah. We have sharks! 
So a couple of other things about the presentation. You'll notice that it's uh, every page is divided into two columns. One of them is a major, like a giant double-sized column, and that has all the text going down. Uh, if you're used to reading in columns like how the other rule books are presented, it, it might feel like the, the the descriptive paragraphs are a little off, and that's the reason. But once you get to the stat block, you do appreciate that the widening space that's given. And then there's a small space on the right that are called the sidebars. Every monster has a sidebar, and the sidebars fall into, I believe, 12 categories? Nope, way off. Five categories of either advice and rules, related creatures, additional lore, treasure and rewards, or locations. And I tended to like a lot of these. In fact, I think most of the time I preferred reading the uh, the sidebars than I did the actual lore for the monster. Yeah, it were. was a little more to the point and a little more practical. Yeah, and they, they're just those small bot side chunks of interesting information. I even liked it with the dragons, uh, which um, with the dragons, they completely changed the format of how dragons were presented in previous editions. But like, usually it'd be like, cool thing about this dragon, cool thing about this dragon, and each dragon always had at least one sidebar. Of, Here is a famous dragon and Galarian and what they're like and what they do and why everybody's scared to death of this gigant, like the sixth king of the five kings mountain is this red dragon that is just like hangs out on the dwarf mountain and thankfully he sleeps a long time but he's due to wake up soon uh, also part of the dragon temp uh, sorry the, the the presentation of dragons is that the spell casting abilities are not in the dragon stat block but they are as sidebars right and, but even Which, then, they're just called typical spellcasting selections for dragons, meaning that you can totally customize it. Yeah, and I think that was a really good use of space because then the... Oh, something major that I want to talk about for the, the way stats are presented. So uh, they're divided into three categories, which is usually like uh, some of the less fun stats like perception and your actually ability scores, mm -hmm. which... Actually, oh, sorry, ability so, score modifiers. So I've got the, the... It's things that are important before combat starts things that are important defensively and then things that are important offensively. That is the three divisions. And then that, miscellaneous. That makes sense. Cause sometimes in the defensive section, there's an action and it's like, why is that there when the bottom section tends to be the action section? So that makes sense. Those are defensive actions. Mm -hmm. um, all right. So uh, one thing really quick, they replaced instead of the ability scores, the ability score modifier. Absolutely happy with that. That's something that I wish they had done in first edition yeah. and did not understand why they didn't just put both in I first edition. would have yep. been happy if they had done that for the entire game. Just yep. saying. Same. <laughs> Another thing that I often complained about stack block presentation in first edition was that they would have DCs without saying what save was attached to it. Mm -hmm. And I would have to reference this in either the core rule book or in the back of the book. And it's like, why are you making me turn pages when you could have just put a three or four letter word in there? That's not going to take up a whole bunch of more word space. So here it tells you right. most of the, because a lot of these are exclusive abilities to these monsters. So if it didn't tell you, there's nowhere else to look, but yeah, it, it tells you what save the DCs are attached to, which thank goodness because that was yeah. so frustrating as a gm one exception is if it's a spell casting ability they just list the character spell casting dc because it would vary between which spell was being referenced and there's another exception i'm going to talk about for spells when i get to the other point that i was uh, tr finally trying to get up to is that the way that the actions are presented is that it does have the action logo which is such a good use of that icon it mm. saves space it saves text and it's so visual that if I'm planning my turn, I'm like, all right, I know my monster needs to do this and this. Oh, I've got a third action. What else can I do? I could quickly narrow it down to just the ones that fit into, you know, my, my menu for that turn, my three action economy. Mm -hmm. The exception being, if you have spell like abilities, you need to reference the actions of the spells because that varies uh, based on the spells. Right. And while it would have been nice if there was some way that it included that information in the stat block, I can't see how because some right. spells vary like you could have one, two or three actions in there and you cannot minimize that in a way that's going to be at all clear. Right. So other than when you're running monsters with spells, you have a lot of information presented in a very little amount of space and running monsters is super smooth because of it. Right. It is like almost, almost everything is here. There is the ability uh, glossary in the appendix for some of the more common abilities that are shared between monsters and they do 
sort of just like reference that ability. So there is the, the occasional case that I do have to flip to the back of the book to read an ability for the first time that I'm not used to. Thankfully, those are very, relatively few. Uh, and a lot of times it's just completely self-explanatory so that even when I flip to the back of the book, I'm like, oh, duh, that's what that meant. And like, I don't even know why I flipped back here. Um, <laughs> but at least, um, uh, but that, that is the other. I do wish, I almost, I do wish they would have made the commitment to make 100% self-contained stat blocks. But that would even mean putting spell text in there. And I guess I can see why there had to be some compromises. Well, I guess it would just come down to, do they want spell casting and spell like abilities? I know that's no longer a term in second edition, but it's effectively mm -hmm. the role of this is not casting a spell, but it looks, it works exactly like a spell. So just read the spell. Would that be removed from monster design and you just focus on every monster as a unique suite of abilities, some of which will be similar to spells, or do you go with spells are the most elaborate rules in the game? We've got this whole other rule book that has them. Mm -hmm let's have some of our more complicated monsters have them. But it, it is, it's not common for uh, monsters to be spellcasters or have spell-like abilities anymore, I would say. Most of the monsters seem like they mostly just have the abilities that are printed on the page. Right. And very unique abilities. Uh, very flavorful, fun abilities. Uh, one of the elementals, uh, there's a, a, one of the things they changed about how all of the elementals are presented is that it's not just by size. They now have very distinct elemental creatures that are presented. It's usually the lowest level one is some sort of elemental animal. And then it's sort of like the embodiment of a natural force. And then like they get more unique the higher they go, which, and also all the elementals also includes one random creature. That's technically an elemental, but I wouldn't have put in the elemental stat block because it was distinct creatures for it, such as the salamanders for the fire elemental section. Yeah, and then you I have get... the air elementals open here, and it's a great, uh, it's, it's exactly like you said. The lowest level one is the Zephyr Hawk, which is just a hawk made of air. Mm -hmm. Then there's the Living Whirlwind, which is, uh, is this one medium size? Yeah, the medium size, which is still the basic concept of what an, ele an air elemental is. Mm -hmm. Then you've got the Invisible Stalker, which is the oddity. I mean, I, yeah, they were an elemental, but that was a distinct creature, you know? Yeah, and I would not think air, so let's go to the air elemental section for the Invisible Stalker. Which, again, we already talked about how mm -hmm. that complicates things. Then you've got the Stormlord and the Elemental Hurricane. Uh, Elemental Hurricane is just, like, the larger version of the Whirlwind. I forget what makes the Stormlord unique. Oh, the, Lightning. So the one that I really like is, like, the Elemental Inferno, like which is, like, the high-level Fire Elemental. It's a Creature 11 a Fire Elemental. has, like, Inferno Leap, which is really Im embodies a lot of what these... Let's just make cool abilities for monsters and not worry about how we justify them. Which is a two-action ability they have, where they jump their speed across a map. In the, anywhere. They just jump their whole speed. And when they land, they burst in a 30-foot explosion of fire all around them. And that's such a, a cool, flavorful thing. You can have fun with it tactically in combat. It's just so much fun. I, like, I'm I'm itching to throw this at my players just because I want to take my big old thing and go, boom, and actually mean a boom. <laughs> now, Param, you, we talked earlier about doing a deep dive into a couple of creatures, and we were going to basically cover I, the cover. I think we already did that. I mean, we didn't okay. cover the cover, but... I mean, if you want to well, go then, Hydra and Cobalt, we can pull them up. I did want to talk about one thing about the Hydra, and mm -hmm. specifically about that two-page spread where something stood out to me okay it's peculiar so if you look at the hydra oh i'm just going to also say uh the hydra on the cover kind of looks like a, a very snaky creature whereas the hydra in the book looks much more piranha like yeah like the piranha one a little more mm. Mm. i'm torn i like them both so something that i noticed when i was on this page if you look at the melee weapon of the hydra it says fangs Whereas on the next page, you've got the hyena. And if you look at the melee weapon, it's jaws. And I was like, okay, well, maybe jaws is more bludgeoning because it's crushing and fangs are piercing. No, no. It does piercing damage, does piercing damage. And ultimately, I realized that melee weapons are not as, as strictly categorized as they were in first edition, where you basically had your bite, your claws, your, your tail whip. Like there was a finite number of attacks that you can have as a monster. Whereas now unless there's a greater mechanical reason for the differentiations, it feels like it's just a little more at the whim of the monster designer where 
yeah, you know what? The Hydra has fangs. Whereas a hyena, when they bite you, it's the jaw that they're worried about. It's basically the same thing. That's something that I'm I'm curious to see if that's just going to be a little chance to add a little more flavor based on the monster or if there's, or just what the purpose is of being a little more open about that. I think it's just the just a side effect of the fact that that isn't that that isn't the jaws as a weapon being added to this creature because this is how jaws work. This is this creature has a special ability that we happen to name jaws because we want it to represent its body bodyness. And but it's not a special ability. It's just melee, and then the name of the weapon in this case is jaws. Yeah, but there is no distinction between that and any other special ability this creature could have had. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm going, yeah, it's weird. But I, uh, I, I just think it's, I just think it's cool. <laughs> uh, okay. Do you want to talk about, uh, is it focused assault or storm of claws? Oh, or storm jaws? of jaws. I mean, they're both, the, they're both the same, the same concept. The Hydra can, okay. So the Hydra was a very classic example of what could have been wrong with first edition's action economy where a monster well we say wrong but definitely i don't know i say wrong um <laughs> it was a downside when a, a turn the system a, a turn would take an eternity because you had to educate a lot of things at once on a turn and the hydra if they had like seven heads and taking all those attacks and all this stuff it could take a long time to do and now i don't know that this actually helps my argument much here because you're still the same thing for Storm and Jaws, for Hydra. So how do you make the Hydra work in a game where you only get three actions? Well, well you can... okay. what I like about this, just what you were talking about, my bigger issue is that it's like the Hydra's got 100 attacks. Unless it moves 10 feet, then it gets one bite. It's got all these heads just waiting. It's like, well, we had to, to walk slightly. And so that completely oh. changes our action economy. And that's what I thought this solved, not... Uh, I hadn't thought of it from your angle. So anyway, continue. Yeah. So now the, the, the Hydra has a, an attack called Storm of Jaws. It's a two action attack. And basically the Hydra gets to make a number of strikes equal to number of heads, which is how it, is, it solves the problem of making sure the Hydra's number of heads still matters. It also has focused assault. Um, oh, but the Hydra's Storm of Jaws, they have to target different targets, which I guess means it's mostly going to make four to six attacks. And there's a lot of monsters that kind of fall under like a solo monster or a boss monster category that have an ability that just lets them target everybody. Mm -hmm. And that really lets, like, it, it, the action economy then plays differently for the monsters. And it's using the top-down approach to, the, to everyone's advantage, to the GM's advantage, because it's like, now I don't have to worry about being saddled with a whole bunch of abilities that I can't use just because it was built in a certain way. No, it goes straight to, you're going to probably want to use this attack, when it's absolutely surrounded or when it's getting overwhelmed, it can still handle a large group of people. Mm, yeah. And the other version of it, Focused Assault, is how do I attack one person? And basically you make a two-action attack and you the, it represents the, the thing attacking it with all its heads at once. And you roll the attack once and you roll an extra d6 for every head it has. So... Um... People in the last couple of episodes may have heard me lamenting the fact that the Yurthak was not included in the bestiary, to which most people, even, you know, deep dive Pathfinder players would say, what is the Yurthak? Yeah, which I, is basically what just, is the Yurthak, Ryan? It's, it's, it, it's a sonic pterodactyl. And the reason I liked it was purely mechanical. It had two abilities, one of which was a focused blast of sonic energy, okay. and one of which was an area of effect. And what I liked about that was it could do basically what we were talking about the Hydra doing. So it's not like I really needed a sonic pterodactyl in my games, but I just knew that if I busted this thing out, I could attack all the party, I could attack a single party, and it only had two abilities that covered all of the ground I needed. That's become a pretty standard thing across monsters in the bestiary. So even though I don't have the Yurthak as an entry, I have the Yurthak in spirit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They're going to add a Yurthak, aren't they? At some point, the Yurthak is probably going to make the cut. But um, I, th I think the Yurthak made it into Bestiary 2 last time, but it was in Monster Manual 1, or I might have that reversed. 
Uh, the Earth Pack is not high on anybody's list of monsters that need to be revisited, except for mine. But <laughs> damn it, I love the Earth Pack. Oh. It uh, might also be I, Pterodactyl was my favorite dinosaur, so I shouldn't completely dismiss that I like the hey, Earth Pack as good a news. Creature. You Ooh. get pterodactyls. There, there is a creature that is a pterodactyl beyond just the dinosaur one. And I was like, ooh, is this renamed Yurthak? No, there's no Sonic abilities. Without mm-hmm. Sonic abilities, it's just not a Yurthak. You know what I'm saying? I was just talking about the dinosaurs because I'm, I'm glad they included the dinosaurs because that would be an easy cut to a bestiary because not every fantasy game is going to have T-Rexes in it. No, but when you need to reskin something, dinosaurs are perfect. It's and just, that- what do you need it to do? Well, this kind of giant beastie thing, boom. And now it's a thunder lizard. Right. And that's what I'm having to do a lot right now for Pathfinder 2 is because I don't have monster building rules, I'm reskinning a ton of monsters. Oh, uh, bandits have attacked. Well, they all happen to be secretly gnolls without some null abilities. And, or, or I need a special version of this demon. Well, that's just this fire elemental renamed. Um, I'm having to do a ton of reskinning until we get the monster creation rules because they're not in this book. And I understand that they're in the other book, but I think this is the book they should have been in. Yeah. Um, not only are they not in this book, but there is some advice that I question why it was included. Mm-hmm. Let me bust that up. It is towards the end of the introduction. Oh, the weekend uh, epic monsters. No, the weekend epic monsters. I liked mm-hmm. that is basically the, uh, sorry, uh, weekend elite. It's basically the advanced template and the uh, young template without us having to worry that we're going around killing so many baby monsters like we had to do in first edition because the the young template was one of the only ways to bump a CR down. So uh, elite adjustments and weak adjustments are just if you want a slightly better or slightly worse, here's some ways to do some uh, some of that power adjustment. No, there is... Hey, Ryan? Some, yo. Put your mic back a little bit. It's, yeah, it's. I think it's just the way I'm holding the book and reading it. Um, shoot, I cannot find the exact entry. But it, effectively, there's a section that says, if you want to give a monster more abilities than it has, just go ahead with no <laughs> guidelines of how to balance that, how that affects the monster's level. It's just like, yeah, sure. You want your orcs to have breath weapons. You want your centaurs to be Pegasus centaurs and they just fly. Just go ahead. And it's like, you, you can't just go ahead like if, again <laughs> if this is somebody's first game and they're like all right so i've done the very interesting encounter budgeting that the core rulebook places but i wanted these centaurs to be pegasus centaurs so they've all got wings and they can all fly it's like oh my goodness i'm destroying everybody because a creature of this this level is not expected to be flying and dealing this much damage um yeah i when i saw that in there and it was like there is no follow-up advice there's no guide. It is just a piece of things you shouldn't do presented as a thing you could do if you wanted to. <laughs> well, I mean, giving orcs a breath weapon, as long as it was a balanced breath weapon, wouldn't be bad. But you have to keep How in do you mind. Balance it? Yeah, I know. You just, you're just going to have to look at other monsters of similar levels to see what abilities you can borrow. <laughs> oh, uh, wait a second. Kitsune Warlock in chat says beta test for monster creation coming next month. It's not is a beta test. True? It's true, but it's not a beta test. Um, so they mentioned this at Gen Con, and I was going to bring it up later when we got d- done with this very conversation, actually. But the monster test rules, they're going to put them out early. Um, they're going to put them out next month. Uh, they said early, so I guess it's next month, when the beta drops. But these are not beta test rules to build monsters. These will be the actual rules to build monsters from the GMG because it's already in the sent to the printers. Sorry, what do you mean when the beta drops? The beta for the four classes. Okay. So, so we, we're okay. beta testing four classes. We're getting the monster creation rules early. The monster creation rules will not be beta rules because they're already done. Are we getting NPC creation rules along with the monster creation rules? It's the same rules. Okay. Because, mm-hmm. yeah. Um, this The best theory kind of presents like, look how elegant and quick you can run monsters with this new tighter format. And then it's like, but if you want to run NPCs, you have to build them the old-fashioned way of just fully statted out classes uh-huh. without even the advantage of like uh, NPC classes so that you have 
you know, the butcher. No, the butcher would have to be an alchemist or a fighter or a barbarian or mm -hmm. something because those are the only ways you can make NPCs that or have no stats. And right. you just give them expert in bakery and hope nobody attacks them. So my solution there is just a lot of my NPCs are orcs. <laughs> They're all orcs wearing NPC masks. I mean, the, the orcs are still pretty brutal for a baker. I mean, he's a he's a good baker. I mean, have you seen Cake Boss? That gets violent. I have seen Cake Boss. I don't remember it getting violent. Uh, Career Nerd, will they put that on the SRD? Uh, so in this case, Archives of Nethys. Or will it be a published book? Uh, I, I, I'd imagine we're getting a PDF, right? As the preview yeah, yeah, of the it's Game a, Mastery it's Guide gonna be a, It's going to be a downloadable document. It's not going to be... It's not going to be an actual book for the Monster Creation Rules. I mean, we will we'll eventually get them in book format when the Game Mastery Guide comes out. But it got pushed back, and because it got pushed back, they said they wanted to release it early. They then announced that they would be, indeed be releasing it early. Um, these aren't going to be playtest rules. They're going to be the final rules. They're probably just literally going to be the pa those specific pages from the book. All right, Pam, there's a couple of other things I want to call out. Then I want to go into the questions we got from our Discord earlier. I did a call out saying like, hey, if you want us to talk about anything specific in this conversation, when we review the book, let us know. And we got a good variety of questions. So one of the reasons I don't like the concept of top-down monsters is just, it's it's more like something, okay, there's a lot of reasons. One of them is that in video games, a lot of times you'll have boss monsters that follow completely different rules from the MOOC monsters. Right. And sometimes the way they do that is just make them immune to a lot of the practical abilities that would completely eliminate the concept of a boss monster. And I resent that. I resent the idea that it's like a mo uh, your player works a certain way up to a point and then you're given a challenge and the rules of the game change because if we had consistent rules, then you would destroy this person in a way that is logical, but not fun. Right. Which, you I know, as a person who plays wizards and uses those abilities that often get immune to, that's annoying. Yeah. I like how the idea of not making a solo monster get easily, you know, one shot by a, disabil a debilitating ability or condition. Uh, I like how it was handled and the purple worm has... Uh, like it's implemented a, a few different ways purple worm has one of my favorite versions it's called shake it off so once per day if the purple worm is affected by a condition or adverse effect such as baleful polymorph this is a reaction the it becomes immune to that one instance of that thing happening what i like about that is that if you as the wizard you you got it to fail its save which it has some incredible saves Yes, you may feel like, oh, but I did a thing and now I have had that thing revoked for me, but it has used up a once per day ability. And so you didn't have the Baleful Polymorph or you didn't have the effect, but you at least burned one of his resources and you could have tactically planned, here's a lesser effect while I'm waiting to hopefully burn out that thing. And now I can do the big thing because now it's no longer immune to it. Like there's things you can think about in a combat to take out this monster and that's all I want. I don't want to say like, now stop thinking about this list of things because it's immune to them. It's mostly immune to them, but there are workarounds. And also I like that it is a listed ability of the monster and not of its type. So that the, because those sorts of characters that are likely to use those abilities are also the characters most likely who want to use the recall knowledge ability because they've invested in those skills to find out what kind of nonsense this thing in front of them might do to them. <laughs> so uh, the cave worms got something like that. I believe the troll, the boss troll, I forget what it's called. Um, over troll. Anyway, it has a thing where if it's on fire, it knows how to shake it off. And that's like, okay, that makes sense with the lore. This troll got to be in its position because even though everyone knows that they have this uh, this weakness to fire, it's figured out a way to overcome that weakness. Not totally, but you know, it's kind of like the arms race played out in an interesting way for everyone involved at the table. Mm -hmm. Career nerd in chat is saying, can you go over the XP budget or encounter building somewhat? Can we save that as a conversation for a future episode? Because yeah. it's, it's interesting, but it's a core rulebook thing. Yeah, yeah. Specifically that, I've got, yeah. Yeah, we will talk about that later. Yeah, we're definitely going to revisit the core rulebook in chunks to focus on. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, is something that's definitely worth revisiting. Mm -hmm. 
All right. So let's I go into I the questions. Yeah, I, I think I got through all my bullet points. So now let's go into what people are asking about. Mm -hmm. uh, Shadows over Scotland. Monsters by L Ruff. Oh, he wants us to talk about monsters. Uh, no, sorry, we're skipping that one. Sorry, monsters are. Uh, yeah, sorry, Shadows over Scotland. Yeah, we kind uh, of did that a lot throughout this book. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, for anyone that's curious. He was hoping that we would analyze monsters not just by here's a favorite monster, here's a favorite monster, but talk about them in chunks of like if I was GM running this. This is the the your options. I probably did not clarify that at all. All right, so simultaneous. Uh, sorry, Sim monstrous arc. Simon, what? No, oh, back up again. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, a lot of movement around this microphone that is very particular about yeah. facing. Uh, Sim monstrous art wants to know about adding class levels to monsters. So that's we have no guidelines. No. Well, um, what they have said is if you want to make your monster more like a class, just give it abilities of that class. Like just literally give it that class's abilities as extra abilities. And if it makes it significantly more um, powerful, bump it up a bunch with the elite or bump it up with the elite a little bit. Yeah. And that like implementing that super easy. It literally mm -hmm. is just slap this action into that stat block how it affects this, the creature level. That's the big question mark. Right. Which is, I imagine things that we will get more concretely told to us in a monster building supplement in the future. Brian Lane has a couple of interesting things. One of them is rampant speculation on how monsters are built since we're waiting for that to be revealed. Um, well, if I'm honestly, I think this will probably be like, um, like we saw in Unchained and Starfinder where we will have, a few set starting arrays um, based off of, like, I imagine there's going to be a big table and it's going to have, is this a broody monster? Is this a casty monster? Is this a sneaky monster? And then you start with these stats and then tweak the numbers as necessary. And just a loose guideline on abilities of abilities should do this much damage if they roll a hit and it's a hard hit or this much damage if they don't have to roll a hit and spells do this much damage. Uh, these are similar to rules like this I've seen in, again, Unchained, in Dungeons & Dragons 4th Edition, in Starfinder, other games that have used this sort of top-down monster-building rules set. And I would also speculate they will have the baseline monsters, where it's like, mm -hmm. if you're making this CR, look at this monster for, you know, just a brute, this monster for a casting type. Mm -hmm. If you are more powerful than that monster, then you are too powerful. Go up a creature level or bump your abilities down. This is all rampant speculation. <laughs> we have no uh, idea Sluder's, how it really works. Justin Sluder's rampant speculation in chat is probably plus one creature level per two feats. Mm -hmm. uh, Brian Lane's other question is our thoughts on Tree Razor. Oh, the big old, big old, big old boy. Well, first, it's a weird way to, 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 uh, to, um, I am failing. <laughs> it's a weird way to what? What's so weird about Tree Razor? I'm having a, 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 a tongue tied moment. All right. So anyone that doesn't know, Tree Razor is the highest level monster in this book. He's level 25. He has a two page spread, partially lower, partially stat block, partially stat block for his magic weapon. Mm -hmm. He is effectively, think of him as the Trask of this book. Yeah. And uh, he's, a, he's a big boy. Yeah, he's, he is uh, unique, which is one of the tags worth mentioning. This is, uses the same standard format for everything that Pathfinder 2 does. So you have the name of something, its category and level, the tags, then the stats. Yeah, and in this case, the tag is the rarity tag, and this is not only just a guideline for the GM of how often these mm -hmm. monsters should show up, but it's also it impacts the uh, recall knowledge roles for uh, PCs mm -hmm. or NPCs you might hire to make recall knowledge roles. So, as a unique creature, he is the highest DC for recalling knowledge about him. Yeah. Um, for a high CR monster, this is a great example of how compact how efficient these character sheets uh, sorry these uh these stat blocks are he has only a few unique abilities he's got spell like abilities and actually his axe provides a whole bunch of additional actions for him mm -hmm. 
I mean, just being around this creature is horrifying because you have to pass a DC 47 fortitude save to not be turned partially into a plant. And what's interesting about that is that most of it is you probably just don't want to be a, tra a plant. But then on top of that, you go down to his other abilities and it's like, oh, he does an additional 2d6 versus plants. He can and, cast and... horrid wilting. Yeah. Which is really cool because th like the whole plant angle didn't have to be in there. They could have just given him abilities that did that to the PCs, assuming that they would be saving these DC 47 fortitude saves, which considering you are adding your level to your fortitude save, you still need to be rolling pretty high unless you have legendary fortitude. Yeah. Right. So, um, but the fact that there's a lot of moving parts to, well, moving parts with a lot of interesting flavor to them makes the concept terrifying. It gives me, if I'm writing the tree razor adventure, you can have the people that it's like, he'll turn you into a tree. What? What does that mean? He'll turn you into a tree. And it's either not until you investigate it or until you actually get into the encounter. Do you understand the ramifications of these weird warnings that you've been getting? Like there is a lot you can pull out of here that you could also have an entire adventure about sneaking into tree razors, lair, stealing black ax, hiding it from him and hoping you've now disarmed him of his legendary weapon only for him to uh, spoilers use the ability that lets him just manifest black axe in his hand teleporting it from wherever it is in the world which just means you needed you didn't hide it far enough oh yeah yeah actually i don't know if it says specifically anywhere on the plane or just anywhere well, let's see you aren't wielding black axe and you are its true owner that's the uh the requirements for this free action black axe appears in your hand teleporting instantly from its prior location oh wow never mind yeah you could teleport it into the middle of the sun on the elemental plane of fire. He's still getting black axe back. That would, oh, it has bulk too. Also for when you're sneaking it out of his lair, <laughs> which is, which is significant. Most characters I'm building do not have to spare bulk to give. <laughs> <laughs> well, two or three people are hoisting it together. Oh, that's not going to attract his attention at all. Never mind us, uh, this tree razor. The sidebar is fun because it's cultists and it actually stats Tree Razor out as a god. So if you want to have worshippers of Tree Razor, you can have a very specific uh, flavored blend of the, the 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 divine magic that they're using. Mm -hmm. I like it. It's a fun monster, and I like that we only get one monster that really gets this kind of personality in this book. Right. I wouldn't be surprised if every book has a single entry like this, and mm -hmm. it just continues the trend of like this is the big bad of this best year this year which which is worth also noting the level spread of the book um for under level five you get tons of monsters tons and tons and tons of monsters level one is like a page and a half in the index um level two is not much worse and then up till about level 12 or so plenty of monsters to choose from of different crs past that Pickens get a little slim, especially the higher you get. Um, usually there's only like five or six monsters of each CR uh, above and that. And you can guarantee a couple of them are dragons, a couple of them are demons, a couple of them are devils. Mm -hmm. Like variety narrows down as well as quantity. Yeah. So, you know, this is not going to... If you, if you only had to use this book to run a campaign on, um, it's going to get real samey towards the end which is honestly a criticism we can say about every version of the first monster manual for a version of this game. True. But with a bottom up approach, you can have templates that add a little more variety. Mm -hmm. Whereas there's really only the two templates that are universal templates. Like there's templated creatures like the vampire where it lets you modify another creature as a vampire, but you can't just throw vampire on everything in the same way you can elite. Mm -hmm. Well, you could, but that'd be a really, really, interesting campaign it would be very vampire specific and but the fact that you can't just throw class levels onto things when you need to just fill in a cr gap that is one of the weaknesses of this this approach and mm -hmm. until we have the monster creation rules which will probably be also usable as monster modification rules mm -hmm. of course they will you can just make a new monster from scrap and say this is the giant orc um if the super orc like career nerds talking right. about in chat I mean, it's, if they're as good as the Starfinder ones, it, I literally am able to make mid to high level monsters in my head 
when I call for a five minute break at the table. It's just weird that one of the things about the best Jerry is that it will be a better book when the game mastery guide comes out. Yeah, that's, and it's weird thinking about Pathfinder as having a third core world book because it's becoming more and more apparent that the game mastery guide is the third core rule book. Yes, which means that to get the three core rule books, it's going to be more expensive to get into Pathfinder than it will be to get into Dungeons and Dragons, since the core rule book is twice the size of the player's handbook because mm-hmm. it was originally intended to be both the core rule book and the game mastery guide. Mm-hmm. Or, sorry, the dungeon master guide as far as when uh, the, what the content of the first edition book was. And not to even talk about page count, because the 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 two books already dwarf all three of the D and D books, and when you start adding in that next one, this is going to be like twice the amount of game, literally. Which I guess is one of the things that Pathfinder is going for. Like they, a lot of the talk that we got from Gen Con was how this is not a simplified version of Pathfinder. This is not Dungeons and Dragons Fifth Edition. Pathfinder is still the crunchy alternative to Dungeons and Dragons. It's just crunch is also going to be page count wise now mm-hmm. and wallet crunch. Mm-hmm. Although Archives of Nethys. Archives of Nethys! A licensed partner with Pathfinder. It is a, a completely free to use SRD with all of the rules. I believe all the rules. Actually, I don't know how Lost Omens are going to fit into Archives of Nethys. Mm-hmm. We'll I'd... find that out soon. Mm-hmm. Well, at least for the core rulebook and the best area, they've got them. You can go look at it now. So, next uh, question. Art. Is art on Archives of Nethys? I forget. No. All right, next. Uh, Lydis is asking about, is the lore light? And asking about story hooks. So that's what a lot of those sidebars are for. They are excellent for mm-hmm. having just ideas of how monsters interact with each other and uh, how you can incorporate them into your campaign. Mm-hmm. Cool new things unique to second edition. Hmm. And I'll couple of this with their next question of things you need to pay attention to if you're new to 2E and Pathfinder. Um, well, definitely take a look at all the actions that things use. Um, some things have improved grab, which, which lets them cheat at grabbing. So definitely look over that. Some things have very special versions of grab, like the blood seekers we talked about earlier. Their bad attack lets them, if they succeed at the bad attack, they have grabbed and they are attached and yanking them off is ouchie. Um, and then just it just because the ability is only listed once doesn't mean they can't use it a bunch. So those constricty animals, those grabby animals, they're they're a little bit more deadly than you think. Uh, the the sturge just being able to just sit there and just drink three times uh, automatically if it's attached to you the round before uh, can hurt can hurt a lot. It doesn't do as much damage as a monster hitting you three times in melee, but it still hurts. And expanding on that, a lot of things that were checks in first edition have now just become automatic things. So grab, trip, these things used mm-hmm. to be combat maneuver checks, but now it's just, this is a rider. If this attack hits, these things happen. Right. And usually, they have, a cat- usually they have to spend an action, even though it hits, like the, the, the trip from the bite, they have to hit the they have to hit the bite attack and then spin the action to make the trip, but the spinning the action's free. They don't have to recheck. They still have to improve grab. They still have to spin the grab action to maintain it the next round, but they don't have to recheck. That's how knockdown. <coughs> I think so. I, uh, I, I'm not sure. I thought it uh, happened automatically. Let me just quickly let reference the, Oh, no, you're right. Knockdown is an additional action. Oh, okay. So that's, well, that's something to pay attention to because when you go into the glossary, it does specifically have the action um, icon next to mm-hmm. knockdown. But if you're just looking at, say, the wolf, where it says uh, on a successful bite, you do the damage, plus it's got knockdown or grab. I was under the impression that this was a little more automatic. So, okay. That's good to know. But, also, um, the glossaries in this and back again, the, the, uh, the, the player, the core rulebook, I almost called the player's handbook in this. Um, the core rulebook, the glossary or the gloss decks, super valuable. <laughs> Do look at them. They've got a lot of useful information back there if you got questions. Oh, and have your critical, condi- or sorry, your conditions deck handy. 
because a lot of the times the writers are effects and that's basically a, a glossary that you could shuffle through and have handy for mm. when you bust it on somebody just be like here now you deal with that on when it's not your turn yep uh, there's other ways that a lot of abilities are affected by the other things that are other actions in your turn so there can be a cascading effect some of these monsters do feel like you are out of control like you make one decision and then there is just a series of things that happened as a result of that and it changes dynamic a lot. Uh, I would say more than what happened in first edition. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I'm not a big fan of that effect, but it's not something that happens for a lot of the monsters. Like in the mm-hmm. playtest, that seemed to be happening every other encounter. Right. But, but they've really pulled that back from the playtest. Right. I'll fact, s- forget everything you knew about mm-hmm. monsters from the playtest. Yeah. Um, there has been a little bit of level shifting. Some monsters aren't exactly the same. One second. Some monsters aren't the same. Okay. CR is a term I'm using incorrectly because it doesn't exist anymore. Monsters have levels, but monsters used to have CRs. The old CR usually matches up with the new level. If I went through every single demon, it matches one to one. Hmm. Not always. Sometimes there's a level or two bump here or there, but most of the time it's one to one. But uh, but just because you knew how a monster worked, most of the monsters across the board have new things they do or handle the old things they do in new ways. So do read the monster. And the most important thing to when you are looking over a monster, the most important thing is just go straight down to its actions and read them because that's what the monster does. All right, we're going to skip through to just a couple of highlights here. I know I can't credit the person who asked it. Someone was asking for any surprises in this <clears> book. <throat> One thing that's definitely surprised me, dragons have the polymorph ability, the ability to polymorph into humans. Uh, sorry, there, shape change. Change shape, the dragon tapes on the appearance of any smaller medium of humanoid. This was something that I know James Jacobs called out as a cliche of dragons that we saw in a lot of fiction that he just didn't, like and he often pointed out that most of the dragons by the book don't have any ability that actually lets them do that people just kind of slap on the ability for them to turn into humans uh it seems like they're now embracing the idea that all right this is a trope people seem to appreciate it we're giving up this uphill battle dragons now all of them universally can change shape into a humanoid medium or smaller no sorry smaller medium Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's a cliche, but it's a fun one. I like playing with it sometimes. And so oh, so much media plays with it. Oh, and you know what? This is unrelated, but the doppelganger... Oh, maybe it is related to a surprise. This was a nice surprise. The doppelganger, when they end the charade, this is when they change shape, they get like an immediate sneak attack, mm-hmm. which is so great because previously when the doppelganger stopped being a doppelganger, it was pretty useless in combat it just like it, it was this great manipulator behind the scenes when it was pretending to be somebody else and then when it was just revealed to be a monster you just beat this thing up and it was dead yeah it, so it, now it, at least it's like all right stab haha it was me all along and then it gets beat to death and... yeah but at least it gets the one right right Uh, the other question that I still wanted to keep up, and I can credit somebody, uh, Darren Caldemeyer wants to know about prep. Param? What do you mean? You're a preppy GM. How do you think prepping is going to be different with this version of the bestiary? I think it's not going to be any different at all. Uh, before you looked up, when you prepped a monster, you had to figure out how it worked with its feats and how they affected its combat stats. And now you're just going to be looking at its abilities and how they affect its what it does in combat. It's a lot easier to run these monsters cold, honestly, because there's not a lot you're going to be cross-referencing unless you're doing spell casting. Um, other than that, it's the same as always. Just throw the right monsters in the right rooms guarding the right pies. I'll get you, pie. I'll mm-hmm. get you. So going back to my issue with top-down... One of the things I like about bottom up is that you can be surprised by a tactic and realize a fun way that the rules interact with each other. Mm -hmm. Whereas top down kind of boxes those things out. It really is. These are the rules for it. And too much out of the box thinking 
leads to just the GM having to make a lot of interpretations. There was other concerns of mine that were addressed well in how this top-down design was implemented. So hopefully, after I get a little more practice with these monsters, G players will continue to surprise me and that it will still feel like first edition monsters. And even though the philosophy has changed, the implementation is similar. That's a hope, though. That is not something I have any evidence within what I'm reading that it will still work that way. Mm -hmm. I think that once we are able to build our own monsters, any any wiggle or, or annoyance we have with anything that's here, we'll just be able to build out of. Because that's going to be the new bottom up. It's just going to be a new set of rules that only they use. So, well, so my best example for the bottom up is that invisibility has a will save, invisibility the spell, mm -hmm. and it's because you can use it on a Medusa, and suddenly she doesn't have her gaze attack, and that's something that it's just because the system works a certain way. That's something that somebody can spring on you just by making by connecting dots. Without the system to make the bottom up thing, it's not necessarily going to happen that way. It's I'm going to either have to intentionally leave in gaps for the players to exploit or unintentionally leave in gaps the players are exploiting and it's not going to have this it, it risks not having the same fun feeling of you have figured out how the universe works you are engaging with the universe as your players would there, there's just like i'm i'm concerned that there will be a deeper level to these monsters that is lost by not having more guts more bones below the surface of the stats I, I guess that's a given. Yeah, there's not going to be a lot of those unintended interactions um, that you'll discover. But I just don't, I just don't think that that's much of a sacrifice when the opposite is we get to make exactly what we want it to do. Like the intended interactions are that much easier to accomplish. See, I never had problems with the old way of getting them to do what I wanted, which is why I don't think of I don't think of it as as big of a gain as you do. So the loss is something that I see as larger than you do. Mm. And again, it's a fear. There is no direct evidence proving it'll be one way or the other. That's just my concern that there'll just be some feeling of like superficiality in some of these combats that one E didn't have. I think what we will, we will we will see a lot of that if your players are able to predict the monster stats ahead of time. Uh, so I guess it depends on what kind of prediction because with top down it's not necessarily a or sorry with bottom up it's not a prediction as much as it is an understanding of the rules. Mm -hmm. Whereas top down it's just it's it's seeing a little bit more of d direct decisions that went to those specific monsters. You know, see what I'm saying? Yeah, I guess. I guess it's just... Remember how I said I could build a monster in my head in five minutes in Starfinder? Yeah. The, the, the bad part of systems like this are that the players can, if they know that system as well, can break a monster apart in five minutes in their head. Right. Uh, oh, uh, one thing I will credit is that low-level and high-level monsters do seem like they are a lot more balanced than... Mm -hmm. First edition, the system had issues. So the monster creation system was implemented poorly at low levels and just had other system problems greater than just the monster creation problems that made high level an issue, whereas the top down does neutralize that. And that mm -hmm. was a goal. And that is something that I commend them. It's like, yes, that absolutely worked. So the, the stuff that I said I didn't mind losing, this is definitely a gain. This is the thing where it's like, that is a positive trade-off for me. Yeah. And I, I'm and having played, you know, some mid and high level encounters, it really like the math works. The, the, the monsters run fast. They're just as deadly as they're supposed to be. I'm very much impressed with how well the system is holding up. The more I push its limits, it's a very monsters are deadly. Still monsters are still super deadly. The numbers make them look deadlier just because I'm still not used to, say, um, um, see, uh, a level 10 creature having saves in the 20s. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Any final thoughts on the best year, Baron? Um, no, I'm really impressed with it. Um, I think it definitely lives up to their legacy as far as presentation goes, as far as monster selection goes. A lot of this is kind of 
obvious, but they did go through that extra effort to include a lot of surprises that is from the Pathfinder or from common mythology that makes this feel like it is the Pathfinder's best eerie, not their latest version of Monster Mania. Yeah, and I think a lot of the criticism that we had were weirdness in layout, weirdness in design, uh, not design, uh, like graphic mm -hmm. design, mm -hmm. stuff that we will get used to. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, I didn't mention it, but I find it weird that the stat block ends the page because I'm just used to then wanting to flip to the rest because I'm used to it being stat block, then text. But mm -hmm. that's just what I'm used to. It's not like that's the wrong way to present a monster. Mm -hmm. So yeah, once uh, once the best area has a little inertia below it, a lot of our uh, our head scratching moments from the beginning of this review, mm -hmm. those will be gone. And also, there is a lot less empty. Like there's a lot less obvious missing parts that there were from Best Year One before. So this means that Best Year Two has got a lot more pressure to be good than it had before. It's not going to be able to do like Best Year Two and Pathfinder One did and just sort of, oh, all the things you knew. Here's the hippogriff. We forgot him. Here he is again. Um, you needed that, right? There a lot of those monsters are in here. There's a lot less monsters that got left behind for space because they made this thing so freaking thick. It is a big freaking book. Is it? It's yeah. It's four hundred some pages, right? No, there's four hundred the monster. It's three hundred fifty-seven. What was the first edition mystery? Uh, most first edition books were t in the two hundreds, like the high two hundreds. Really? Huh? Yeah. I guess just next to the core rule book, this feels like the small second edition book right now. Right. It is because it is the small second edition book, but this is thick for a bestiary. And the next bestiary is not going to be this many pages. It's going to be a normal sized one. Uh, I see on the page right now, it's 320 pages, the next one. Oh, well, never mind then. They're, they're going <laughs> to gonna make that big, ain't they? Hi, sir! You're breaking my back. I can't carry all this. I know you're not feeling great. Do you have time to speculate a little bit on something that uh, was talked about early on in second edition's development? Sure. What are we doing? Well, just because you were talking about page count, Eric Mona once uh, posed a question on the forums, the Paizo forums, asking, would people like a 600-page bestiary that just covers as many of the monsters as possible? So what are your thoughts? Are you happy with the 400-page extra sized one or do you really think the game would have benefited more from a double sized one and then the core rule book and the best jerry would have been like you know a, i was gonna say a shoebox but yeah I, let's say shoebox height i think that i think that they made the correct choice to make this extra big but not a monster because i'm already worried and i'm already seeing people intimidated away from pathfinder just because of the even and it just got worse. Like the, the, the core rule book is extra, extra intimidating now. Um, and sure that's the niche and it's working for the game now, but I think if I paired that with another giant, massive tome, well, first traveling to society would just suck because it's already heavy. That book bag is already heavy. I'm already praying for compact versions of this to exist. Um, I desperately wish for them, uh, I think a 600 pound pestiary. It, it worked for Tome of Horrors, but it can't work. It, uh, there's a reason that we marvel at that giant book, but now that book is mired in controversy. So, but that's simple. Mired fun. in controversy. Yeah, because of Bill Webb's involvement, which we won't go into. Oh, uh, yes. Okay. Um, but a gigantic freaking book uh, would not be would not be ideal. I'm I'm, I'm happy with the decision they made. All right. Also, you're not feeling well. Do you want to cover the banter that we were talking about, or is that something you'd rather put off? Uh, I think I do not have another hour left in me. No problem. Let's go to an extra long shout outs. Extra long shout outs. So we'll be right back with the shout outs right after this. Mm -hmm. And we're back. Thank you for joining us for episode 207 of the No Direction Podcast. Before we go, there's a couple of things we want to bring people's attention to. One of them is Path Builder. Path Builder is an app. It is a character building app that has an amazing reputation, amazing ratings, 
on uh, the Google Play App Store. I say Google Play because it is not available for iOS. It is only an Android uh, mm -hmm. app, but it is one uh, with a great reputation. And the reason I'm saying reputation is that I have not played around with it as much as I'd like to have, but um, they've got a 2E version out, which is uh, an impressive turnaround time for what I'm told is a one-person studio that is designing this app. It's a good-looking app. It has elegant interface, and you can export to PDF, and then you can print out your character sheets and uh, have them on your computer as a PDF. So it starts as on the app, but then it can move on to other devices. Um, it's out. It's available now. Check it out. It's something that uh, I might revisit in the near future when, uh, like, we might do uh, what's available for Pathfinder 2nd Edition now. Because one of the big losses when Pathfinder 1 went over to Pathfinder 2 is all of the digital tools and all of the, right. the online resources. So Man, they're starting they to trickle out. Not trickle out. They are coming out in force faster, faster than they came out for Pathfinder 1. I'm seeing spreadsheets uh, coming out i'm seeing uh tons of character sheets i'm seeing a lot of apps and and support exist that just it's just like they they know what they're doing and they're pumping this stuff out at an incredible pace i like yos media one's uh, comment in chat they churn out characters on the train to work both editions of are of pathbound builder are wonderful mm-hmm um, I have no, not uh, used Path Builder either, but almost my entire player base has, and they all love it. So I, I, uh, I assume they like it for a reason. All right, I have uh, you know I have several shoutouts here, Param. So you just jump in whenever you want. Mm -hmm. But I want to talk about Plunderlings. Plunderlings is a campaign currently on Kickstarter for basically goblin action figures if you look at these guys they've got the melon heads that we're very familiar from pathfinder um they're good looking action figures they've got tons of articulation fun accessories a lot of personality to the head sculpts and i also appreciate how uh smartly they are designing these because the most expensive part of a uh of an action figure is the the mold and they're actually going with minimal molds having a very basic nearly naked goblin that is oh, then not nearly they have a loincloth. Look at the berserker. Oh, yeah. All right. So <laughs> nearly naked or flat out naked goblins, you know, not uh, anatomically. They're, they're still safe for work. Around. Yes. Um, yeah. So I appreciate that they're just like are offering a wide variety of these with a, a lot of the personality is added through the accessories. And it's a little expensive, like I, as much as I would love to just have a whole shelf of these goblins they are going for 30 bucks each and that is the the kickstarter price so i imagine when they finally do hit stores they're going to be closer to the 40 dollar range which you know that's a couple of boss fight action figures and a couple of boss fight action figures is several marvel uh legends so the price isn't amazing but the execution is strong enough that i am probably going to back this and i recommend other people check it out if for no other reason than to see what a pathfinder goblin action figure could look like they look cool. and i hope that they don't look a little too much like pathfinder goblins and my shouting out to them actually gets the whole thing shut down you know they i was wondering about that because there was some anyway yeah this wouldn't be the first time things looked a little too much like a pathfinder goblin <laughs> what's, uh, what's well, next 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 one i'm actually going to move this one to the bottom for when we do other you know all the shout outs uh, oh, yeah. So uh, between last episode and this one, we uh, conceived of, executed, and concluded a contest. Mm -hmm. So I am just bringing attention to the fact that this was a fun little thing we did on the website uh, through social media. And if you missed it, sorry, we'll we'll try and do something like this again. You know, we can Cooper time it better <laughs> next time. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> So Alan Cooper is the artist who did the the Stellar characters. Mm -hmm. Stellar being our Starfinder actual play podcast, which is hosted or GM'd by uh, Vanessa Hoskins from the network. And uh, Alan's an amazing artist. He is someone that I have uh, known for a long time. I've known him for over 20 years. He's one of my oldest friends. And we have worked together on several things. He did my kids' books. He did art con contributions to strategists and tacticians. If you uh, follow me on Facebook, then every now and then you'll see I'll put up just artwork of my family and it'll usually be from Christmas cards or whatever. 
and it's Al. Al does all that art, and he does a whole a variety of styles. I know just how diverse Al's uh, skills are. And um, one day, Lauren, uh, also from the network, Lauren Seek, came up, uh, sent me a message saying, I've got an idea for a contest we can do. What if we draw, like the staff of No Direction draws people's characters for them? And I'm like, that's fun, but also it lacks a little substance because none of us are good artists. Alex is a much better artist than I realized. Yeah, yeah. Alex is uh, drawing. I was like, when he turned it in, I was, I mentioned him like, this is almost too good for this contest, Alex. (laughs) (laughs) So yeah, so Lauren put the, the idea in my head of like, oh, we could do some kind of art contest, but we need an actual prize, not just the kind of novelty prize of No Direction non-artist staffers doing the art. And then like minutes later, I saw Al post that sometimes he goes on Reddit, reads people's character descriptions in the Dungeons and Dragons section, and just draws their character for them. And I'm like, hey, Al, would you mind doing that for some of our listeners? And he was totally on board. He, uh, we, we worked out a, a launch day that worked for him. And we launched this contest where people submit their character descriptions. Al looked over them. He did the artwork for three of them. Uh, in this case, it was Billy Carr, Chaz, uh, what was Chaz's last name? Chaz Gabriel and Joshua Lee. So listeners, friends, fans of the page, they had their artwork done. It, it's three different art styles for the th- different ones. It's very different characters. Uh, you can go to nodirectionpodcast.com, check out the post for the Alan Cooper Art Contest winners to see what he turned over. And then you can scroll to the bottom and see what the rest of the staff did for the runners up where, uh, cause we had over 20 entrants to this. So there was plenty of characters that did not have Alan Cooper art. So we followed up and gave them the best art that we could muster, which was not nearly as good as Al's. But uh, I, overall, this was a really fun contest, and I look forward to finding other ways we can do contests like this, because uh, I can tell you that contests don't always work out too well mm-hmm. on the, when, uh, when you're like content creators like us. For whatever reason, people don't enter them as much as you would expect them to, and sometimes just you put a contest out there excited for how it's going to go. You get no entrance, and you just kind of let the whole thing die. But this one was people had one day to enter, People entered in spades. There was a lot of engagement during, after the reveals. Uh, it was fun. It's <laughs> easily my favorite contest we've ever run. Mm-hmm. And so I'm looking forward to finding other ways we can do some similar contests or at least contests that have a similar uh, response from the fans. And speaking of Alex, uh, Alex just today released the first of his Cards for Everybody a product for Pathfinder 2 with starting with the fighter, the core fighter deck. This is basically a card for all the feats and character options that a fighter might have so that you can have them as reference um, for all the things you can do. And for the fighter specifically, that's a good one to start with because the fighter is totally the closest one to each of their class feats being a special ability they can do. Like we we talked about in the review, the fighter basically gets to say, I cast spinning attack. Yeah, it's a really cool product. If Mm -hmm. you go to the drive-thru RPG page that has it, you can watch a fun promotional video he does that really shows Mm -hmm. uh, the graphic design, which is really nice. And just the the play value of these cards. You get a deck of 98 cards. You can order either a watermarked PDF, printed cards, because uh, drive-thru RPG does print on demand, even with cards. Or you can get the combination. Uh, it's twenty dollars for either of the single things, or a bundle. You get thirty dollars. Yep, and ninety-eight cards in total for the fighter set. And, and like they they look of, really good. Like the they yeah. have, he has like unique art for each of the cards, which is like a bit above what I was expecting for a product like this. Yeah, I don't know if this is the default, but when you go to the video, my still image for the video is illustrators it says Jacob Blackman and Caroline Bastos. That's actually the first two of a long list of artists. This is like, on top of being a practical um, mm-hmm. accessory, it's a focused accessory. It's really a good looking product. Yeah. Good on you, Alex. All right. And Oh, yeah. The other cool thing. Well, the other cool thing we'll kind of wrap into where people can uh, get in touch with us, Param. Well, you can get in touch with us. In, uh, of course, the best way to find out anything we're doing is at nodirectionpodcast.com, 
where you can find all of our shows, all of our blogs. We do some great blog content with some fantastic blog authors. We have several podcasts talking everything from Pathfinder, Starfinder. We've got some actual play podcasts that just cannot be missed. There are some fantastic crews on those. And you can also find links to our Discord channel, for instance, where you can chat with us anytime. We're always on there. We're always active. The community there is large and very, very chill. It's one of my favorite places to hang out. You all are awesome. Make sure you click that Discord link and join the community. You can also find um, links to our Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and of course our Patreon, because none of this is possible without the support of our patrons. We very much appreciate all you're able to do to help keep this channel on the air and keep us improving and growing. And speaking of improving and growing, we recently had an addition to the continuing to grow no direction uh, emoji suite that we've got in Discord. Randall, uh, Randall Meyer, one of our uh, bloggers, took the time to crop out the faces of the Adventurous cast, the Stellar cast, and the three um, unconditioned cards that uh, we've put out so far and has added them all as reactions that you can have in Discord. Uh, he also did me the favor of having Xavier's abs. Just as, the abs. because specific reaction. Right. Yeah, yeah, a close-up on the abs. Because mm -hmm. that's all that matters. <laughs> so, yeah, it's... Uh, Discord continues to be a growing community, and it's also our Discord channel specifically is uh, growing in personality because of little touches like this. And I just, I, I enjoy it. It's a fun way to get a little infusion of Pathfinder into your day if you only have a couple of minutes to jump in. Uh, and it's also a great place that we are continuing to share news from. It's kind of becoming the main place of like, oh, this is an interesting Pathfinder related thing. It's not worth a news article, not even worth a Facebook share. But boom, we'll just pop it into the share of the news mm -hmm. section. Yeah, that's also I learn about so much because you all tell us stuff. I love the Discord because, like, as much as we try to stay on top of things, just all of our fans are instantly more reactive than that. And uh, I learned so much about about Pathfinder just because you all are on top of things and link it in the Discord chat. So until next time, I'm Ryan Costello, and I'm Jefferson J. Thacker, also known as Param. And if you want to find the path, you need no direction. <laughs>